Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to the Documentation Best Practices for Family Peer Support Providers webinar. Um, as Fung mentioned when she came on, this is part two um, of a two-part series on documentation for family peer support providers. Um, so if you were unable to join us uh, at the first one, we will provide you with some information in terms of how to access that. Uh, my name is Yvette Kelly with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I am joined by my colleague, Anne Cuppinger. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping things uh, that we need to review. Um, first, slides and recordings uh, will be posted to the CTAC website within the next few days. So again, if you did not have the opportunity to um, join us for part one, you will be able to access it there. Um, there will be a brief question and answer period following today's presentation. So we're asking that participants submit their questions at any point during the webinar, and we will do our best to address them at the end. Uh, I do want to be clear again that, we, as I mentioned, we will do our best to address um, all of the questions that we uh, receive in the time allotted, uh, but we want to recognize that there may be questions that we may not be able to answer, and if uh, that is the case, we will need to uh, take your question back and uh, send that along to the Office of Mental Health for review uh, to see if we can get the right answer. Um, questions can be submitted utilizing the chat box feature located on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, if the box isn't visible, please click there's a little dialog box along the bottom, and if you click that, uh, the box should appear. Um, again, this, is, uh, this webinar is intended to provide you with some um, information around uh, documentation required, so as always, we want to refer you to um, the guidance uh, regarding documentation. So this, uh, please do not refer to this presentation as a, the official guidance, but instead you will need to uh, consider the proper documents and um, look on the uh, OMH and New York State DOH site uh, for relevant policies regarding documentation requirements. I'm having trouble moving myself. Okay, so um, again, uh, I just spoke about part one, and if you joined us last week, you know that we talked about quality documentation and how you can uh, tune up your notes to be reflective and consistent with principles and uh, core principles and best practices. We also briefly touched upon pathways to care, um, the concepts, again, that uh, in your documents that will reflect what you're uh, working with, you know, that you're working with the family for the benefit of the child, and again, service authorizations. In today's webinar, we're going to cover uh, primarily treatment planning for family, family peer support providers. We do get lots of questions around this, and so we'll share some information related to that, as well as progress note requirements and tips. Um, I just want to point out that there, there are a number, again, of uh, several CESTSS specific resources that you should be familiar with. We've provided um, a couple of the documents here as well as the links to them, so if you have an opportunity to please re uh, review them. Again, just mentioning that this presentation is not the official guidance, but you can find the official guidance um, within these documents, so please, if you have any uh, questions after today's presentation, uh, please refer to them. I also want to remind you that we are also having uh, a documentation webinar that's scheduled on October 31st at 1130. Uh, this will be a webinar in which state partners from the Division of Integrated Community Services uh, for Children and Families will provide a review of the official health record documentation guidance that you see here noted on uh, your screen. And so you can register for this webinar at our CTAC website, um, www.ctacnewyork.org. You'll be able to uh, find the registration information there. And again, I'm just going to encourage you, there will be some concepts that we will be reviewing um, in today's presentation that uh, really will be cross-referenced with some of the concepts that will happen um, um, on the October 31st webinar. So we do want to just encourage you um, to uh, register for that. We think that it would probably be um, helpful in just understanding and bringing some more depth to the concepts that we're going to speak about today. And just a reminder of what the core principles are, and you'll hear us talk about this throughout uh, the presentation because these are the core principles that, that 
should be taken into consideration uh, when doing documentation, whether it be treatment planning, progress notes, assessments. And so we just want to remind folks that uh, when we're writing information re relative to what's happening uh, with, with the case, that we should be reflecting um, some best practices within that. And so this really gives credence to the provider as well, um, that you are working in the best way possible with the family or the individual. And so um, overall, your documentation should reflect uh, the family care support principles, um, including that a parent or the caregiver is an expert on their child and the family is key, and so that you utilize information from the family to begin to uh, develop your, your plan and priorities uh, with the family. Um, and it, your goal is to empower uh, the parents and build resiliency, so you always want to be making sure that when you're working um, with families that your paperwork and documentation reflects that kind of concept. Um, they're always working to build natural and community support that it, that's critical uh, to the family's long-term success. And that services are delivered um, in a culturally respectful and responsive way. Um, and then to be effective, uh, you work with each family and that um, how you work with them is individualized. And so you are meeting the family where they are and really um, identifying, again, in, uh, collaboratively with the family and other service providers in terms of what it is that, uh, you know, is a priority for the family um, and what is the best way to work with this family. And again, um, that this plan is really individualized to that family uh, and their unique needs. And then lastly, I just want to talk about this concept as I know that many of you are familiar with the golden thread concept. So uh, this is a concept that all components of documentation must connect in a consistent and coherent way. Um, and, and so your treatment plan should reflect uh, the strengths and the needs documented in the recommendation by the LPHA um, and by your own assessments, and that your progress notes should describe the services uh, that you've identified in the treatment plan. Um, and then your progress notes should really capture the progress of those uh, goals and objectives that you're working on. And so this is important just to keep in mind as we talk about um, documentation and again, bringing in some of those core concepts, but being mindful about how all of this documentation links together um, in order for you to have a clear picture, you along with other service providers, along with the families, to have a clear picture of service delivery. And with that, I am going to pass it off to my colleague, Ann Coppinger, to walk us through the next section. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, and thank you, Yvette. So we're going to start by talking about some of the basic, uh, you know, components and concepts behind treatment planning. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about progress note writing. Um, and then following that, we're going to take a look at how that kind of plays out by actually uh, giving you some examples. So um, just to start off with, I think everyone knows this, but it can be really easy when things are busy and you're writing a lot of documentation to uh, take some shortcuts and find yourself writing uh, progress notes, treatment plans, uh, discharge summaries that really are not individualized, that are what we call cookie cutter plans. This is something that can really um, be an issue on audit, not to mention an issue for parents when the actual um, goals and objectives um, and things that you're working on with them are not really specific to their needs and really changing as their needs change. So just a reminder um, for supervisors and individual staff people that this is something that um, auditors will be looking for. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to detect when you start to see um, very repetitive, um, you know, word for word progress notes or treatment plans. Um, that doesn't mean you're not going to be engaging in some similar activities with different uh, families, uh, but, you know, you'll know the difference uh, when that note is written in a way that's really specific to that family. So a few tips related to keeping your work consistent with the principles of the golden thread. So first of all, as we just talked about, those goals and objectives need to be individualized and based on the assessment, reassessment, or treatment plan review for that particular uh, child and family. Um, the progress notes need to be um, related to the issues that are identified in the assessment and the treatment plan. So if you write a progress note 
um, or multiple progress notes over a period of time that are addressing an issue that was nowhere present in the assessment or in the treatment plan, um, you're going to have a problem because um, all of your progress notes need to relate to um, that assessment and the goals and objectives in the treatment plan. There are some exceptions if there are crises and things that pop up. Um, you'll see you know, progress notes that are about, you know, novel events or new issues. Um, but if those are going to be ongoing, then that's a clue that you need to go back and take a look at um, revising the treatment plan and potentially um, bringing in some additional services. So uh, your treatment plan goals and objectives and your overall strategy should be changing if there's no progress. So uh, note after note of, wow, we're really not making any progress or I haven't been able to meet with the family for this week or that week, um, that's an indication that something isn't working. Um, and that you might need to go back and revisit, is this the right goal? Is the family ready to work on this goal? Um, or maybe we haven't broken it down into enough uh, steps in our different objectives. Um, so again, you know, there will be periods of time where progress is slow, but if that goes on for too long, you're gonna wanna take a look at your treatment plan. Um, treatment plans also need to be updated when significant new issues are identified. Um, as I said, if you know, th new things come up, a uh, family may become homeless or a youth may uh, go into crisis and that's an opportunity for you to update the treatment plan. So everything stays alive and moving um, in this process. So the process begins um, with this LPHA recommendation and we talked about this quite a bit during the first webinar, um, but this, is, this means that um, a child who is receiving services, family peer support services, um, needs to be recommended for those services by a licensed practitioner of the healing arts. Um, this is a sample, there's a link here to a sample form that that person, the LPHA, could complete to provide you, the Family Peer Support Program, with enough information about that child's diagnosis, their functioning, their needs, and why that licensed practitioner thinks this service is appropriate so that you can begin um, to have a conversation with the family and put together a treatment plan. This form is not, this specific form is not required. You can develop a form that works for you, but you're gonna to wanna to make sure it covers some of these basic areas so that you have enough information to proceed. So you're gonna write an initial treatment plan by the fourth session or no more than 30 days after the first face-to-face -face with the parent or caregiver. During the, that initial period of time, and it could be shorter than three visits, you're going to conduct an assessment of the parent or caregiver's needs and strengths. You're going to uh, develop a treatment plan and outline the steps that the parent's gonna take with support from you to help their child make progress on the needs outlined in the LPHA recommendation. Um, that treatment plan will need to be signed by the parent or caregiver, by the family peer advocate, and by the family peer advocate supervisor. And parent involvement in this process is absolutely required. Obviously, you all realize why that's important, but it's not just a nice thing, it's actually a required thing, and it's something that auditors will be looking for evidence of. So that treatment plan and the treatment planning process is not just a piece of paper that gets filed away. It's meant to really be a process wherein you engage families in a conversation about their needs, their strengths, their goals, their priorities, what their vision is for the fam their own family and their child, and what steps they're ready to take um, on their own or with you. So it's really um, not meant to be something that's just sort of a bureaucratic formality, but the basis for engagement and a conversation. You're gonna be coming back to that plan repeatedly with the family, and it really will help you kind of form an agreement around how you're gonna to work together. What's the parent gonna be working on? How are you gonna support them? What can they expect from you? And what can you expect from them? So really think of this as an opportunity um, to structure that conversation. A lot of people ask, how am I gonna demonstrate parent participation in the treatment plan? Is their signature on that plan sufficient? Um, you do need the signature, but it's not sufficient to really give someone the sense that that parent was act actively involved. So um, the progress notes, uh, which are separate from the treatment plan but related, need to reflect that the parent um, has had input, that they have ideas, that they have reactions to what you're working on, and that those 
uh, kind of responses to your work with them are influencing planning. So you might write a note that says that the parent really didn't find what you did helpful. Or you might find a note that said that um, they found the strategies that you, uh, you know, helped them develop for handling a situation really uh, started to work and they're looking to expand on that. The assessment that you use, and some people use the family assessment of needs and strengths. Some programs use other kinds of family peer support um, assessments. Make sure that that assess assessment includes the parent's perspective on their priorities, needs, and desired supports. So it's not just you looking from a distance and saying, I think this parent needs this, or an LPHA making a recommendation um, that is completely disjointed from the parent's perception of what will work in their family. You really want to use an assessment that engages that family in shaping um, you know, everyone's understanding of what will help them move forward. Um, when it's possible, you want to write treatment plans in words um, that would be used by parents. So, um, you know, people often say, what does that mean? It doesn't have to necessarily be a quote, but just as an example, saying something, um, let's say you write a goal that says the mother would like to develop more effective skills to manage sibling conflict. That's okay, but it's more likely that the mother would express that goal in words like, the mother would like to get better at helping Joey and his siblings enjoy doing things together after school. Or, you know, the mother would like to reduce the number of times that she needs to raise her voice in order to get, uh, you know, the child to out of the house in the morning to go to school. So um, really think about how to write those um, goals and objectives in words that sound like something that families would recognize. Um, and sometimes even in the actual words of, of the family member. Um, you also want to really support the family and document this in your notes to fully participate in the treatment planning process. It's really hard to show up at one of these meetings and really participate fully if you haven't been prepared. So before those meetings, you may have a session where you kind of review current evaluations, you review the child and family's progress. Uh, make sure you document that. Um, you may also want to implement some strategies that really ensure that families feel comfortable participating in those meetings, including sometimes some practical support. They might need a translator. Um, you might need to make the meeting a little bit longer so it doesn't feel so rushed. Indicate this in your notes so it's really clear that the family member has participated in treatment planning. Uh, treatment, plannings, uh, treatment plans are not static documents. They should not be, again, filed away. Um, you can expect to be updating the treatment plan uh, frequently. Formal treatment plan reviews are required um, every 180 days or not less often than every 180 days but they absolutely can and should be done more often if there are significant changes. So in family support, unlike some other services, uh, you are not working directly with the child. You are working with the parent. Now, as you remember from our last conversation, Medicaid really views the child as their beneficiary. So you need to be careful in your documentation that all of the things that you write about and describe in terms of your work with the parent are framed in reference to how that work relates to the child's LPHA recommendation and uh, their goals and objectives. It's really not that hard to do, but it just takes a little while to kind of, um, you know, wrap your head around that. So, in terms of goals, objectives, and interventions, which are the things that are going to be the components of your treatment plan, and because I know we'll get this question, there is not a standard treatment plan form. You can use everybody's um, electronic health record handles this a little bit differently. Um, those of you who are still uh, using paper documentation, you may already have a treatment plan type of form that you use, um, but they, every treatment plan um, we'll have goals, objectives, and interventions. And for family peer support, here's how we want you to think about those categories. Goals are broad desired outcomes for the parent or caregiver to help them meet the child's identified need and goals per the LPHA recommendation. The objectives in your family peer support treatment plan are specific steps that the parent and caregiver or caregiver will take to meet 
those identified goals. So that's broken down steps that are written in ways that are uh, measurable and very specific so you know when they're accomplished. What is it that the parent's going to do to help reach that goal? Um, and then the interventions or strategies, which for those of you who work in waiver were at that time called methods, um, those are the steps that you're going to take, the services that you're going to provide, the way that you're going to support the parent or caregiver to meet those goals and objectives. And in that section where you're writing about interventions, you're going to talk about what you're going to do, you're going to talk about how often you're going to do it and how long you're going to do it for, so that the person who's reading this plan has an idea of what you anticipate happening in terms of rough time frames. Those can always be adjusted in a treatment plan revision. So the building blocks for a treatment plan really are the four areas um, in your scope of practice as a family peer advocate. These are the things that you, according to uh, the definition of family peer support, uh, these are the kinds of services that you can provide. And when you look in that um, CFPSS uh, provider manual, you'll see a lot more detail under each of these main categories. But if you look at these, you can see that these are very broad and there are all kinds of different things that you can do um, with families that fall under these categories. So it's really helpful when you're building a treatment plan to think about these categories. Uh, so you've had a conversation with the parent, you have this LPHA recommendation, and you're thinking about how can, um, and talking with the parent about how can I uh, translate that into a, a treatment plan. So here are a couple of examples of just uh, the kinds of statements that may appear somewhere in your treatment plan and how they map onto those areas. By the end of June, the parent will learn about and begin to use two new parenting approaches that will help her foster daughter who has a history of trauma indicate when she is feeling stressed. Now, these are just sound bites, so we don't really know what the overall goal was and we aren't talking here yet about the uh, specific strategies that the family peer advocate is going to use to support the parent to accomplish this objective. But as you can see, what we're talking about here is what is the parent going to do? And we're very clearly talking about how that will impact um, her daughter. Here's another example. Once a week for the next eight weeks, the parent will visit her child at the RTF and participate in team meetings to develop a plan to help her son transition home in a way that works for everyone in the family. Little side note here, there are some issues around billing for family peer support when a child is in an RTF, but this might be something that you would do that was not billable, um, but it might also be that you're actually a family peer advocate working in the RTF and this is something that would be a goal on one of your treatment plans. A couple other examples. Parent will take his son to play group in the community center, at the community center, twice a month for the next two months so they can both meet some other families in the area. This is you working with the parent um, to help them develop natural supports in the community. Parent will learn about what happens at a CSE meeting and attends the December meeting to share her perspective on her daughter's needs and learn more about support services. So you can easily imagine what the child's LPHA recommendation in each of these cases might have said, and these are goals that you've developed with the parent um, you know, to help you uh, reach, uh, reach, help them reach those goals. We put labels on these. You don't need to do that in your treatment plan, although I have seen some treatment plans where they actually do sort of check off um, the family peer support service area that that goal relates to. Um, we've also gotten some questions. We got one last week, and I want to answer it now, around how do I make sure that the goals uh, and objectives and interventions in my treatment plan um, or that the objectives and interventions are clearly tied to um, the child's goals. So it kind of depends on the situation that you're in. Um, if a child is only receiving family peer support services, while you have the LPHA recommendation, you don't actually have a child, let's say, clinic treatment plan that lists specific goals and objectives. So you're going to make sure that your treatment plan states somewhere this is the information that we got on the LPHA recommendation uh, so that someone can see that the work that you're doing relates to that. If a child is receiving other services where there are actually goals and objectives for the child, um, 
and hopefully you are able through networking and conversations with the parent, working with the plan and the health home, you'll learn what those other services are. Um, then you can actually sort of take some of those goals off the child's plan and think about which ones you can help with um, in family peer support, again, based on that LPHA recommendation. So imagine a scenario in which a child is in clinic, the clinician's thinking, wow, I could really use some support from a family peer advocate. They write the, the, the recommendation, um, and then they can share with you, with permission from the family, that child's clinic treatment plan, and you can, you know, reference those child goals directly in, in your work. Okay, so now we're going to um, talk about some of the components of a treatment plan. Um, I'm not going to go through these in a great deal of detail because that's something that's going to happen on the webinar on um, October 31st. But you'll see that there's going to be a need for a little bit of translation here for you because um, in that guidance document, it's really um, kind of assuming that the treatment plan is being written um, for the child as opposed to for the parent on behalf of the child. But take a look at these um, ingredients because you're going to need to make sure that your documentation, whether it's uh, in, on paper or in an EHR, hits on all of these elements so that it's complete. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yvette to talk a little bit about progress notes. Thank you, Anne. So, um, so Anne just kind of went through um, some of the requirements in terms of writing a treatment plan. And if we go back to the original graphic of the golden thread, again, we're trying to show how all of this documentation really links together. And progress notes is really an essential element of that. Um, because it's, it's actually one of the most important and fundamental activities um, that happens in behavioral health services. And so we just want to spend a few minutes talking about, um, you know, some requirements and some components for uh, progress note writing. The one thing that I want to say is while you'll see on the paper, I know, um, you know, some may be overwhelmed with the amount of information presented because it is a lot of information. Um, but the one thing that I want to say is when in actual practice, um, I get a lot of questions around like how long should progress notes be and all of those questions. And so I just want to emphasize quality over quantity. Um, I think we'll go through some elements that are required for a progress note, but um, you know, you can um, very much do these things without writing long documents or having very long narrative progress notes. And so uh, you know, when, when Ann and I go around and do some uh, training around this, we talk about how you could, uh, you know, get the, put all of the information in that is required in the note in a very succinct way. Um, that can take you five minutes or less, believe it or not. And so when we talk about all of these elements, again, um, you know, some of this stuff may be easier if you have an electronic health record um, versus if you're doing it on paper. But again, I think most of this can be accomplished, again, very, very quickly once you get the skill of kind of identifying what needs to be in the note and then um, writing, writing the note um, that really just takes a little bit of practice. So the progress note is important because it provides evidence of the services um, that are delivered um, on behalf of an individual or family that relates to one's progress in treatment. So really it is your kind of record of the work that you're doing. And, um, you know, there's a lot of hard work going on out there, so we want to make sure that, um, you know, that providers are getting, um, you know, credited for that work that they're doing. And so that's why it's so important to kind of, wrap all of, again, those core concepts and um, all of that needed information into a progress note. Um, it details the areas of need, gains, and achievements made by the individual and their family. Um, and so, again, tells the story of how a family has been doing in treatment, or, you know, are the goals and objectives identified on the treatment plan? Are, the, are, are they meeting those goals? Do those goals need to be adjusted? And perhaps the rationale for why that is but really does kind of tell the story of how the family and the provider is working together to meet the goals and objectives. Um, and it contains the necessary details to support medical necessity um, of each delivered and subsequently billed services. So again, um, identifies why it is, why it is that this family needs the service, what, you know, what are you working on, what are the goal areas, and why is that needed? And so um, progress notes really do detail all of that. Uh, progress notes must be completed for services delivered 
um, and this is direct service to a child or family, um, coordination or collaborative contact on behalf of the child or, or family. And I also want to point out that sometimes, um, although uh, events are not billable per se, uh, you may want to document them, you know, due to the nature of the contact. And so I always want to preference that. Um, because just because something is not billable does not mean you should not um, identify in a progress note. Um, so perhaps an example of that may be is that, um, you know, you were scheduled to meet with the individual um, and they did not arrive and you didn't know, you know, why they did not arrive. You might want to make a note that says, you know, I was scheduled to meet with this individual this day at this time. Um, you know, unfortunately, the family did not arrive. You know, I will follow up. So those are all things, of course, not billable, but important to know. And I think important to know as um, the life of the case as well. So you can really kind of keep track of, of the progress made. Um, you also want to have a progress note for significant or unexpected events. Um, again, may not may not necessarily be a billable um, progress note in the way, you know, it depends on kind of how the event played itself out. But you, if it's significant to the family's case and to their progress and to what's happening with them, then you definitely want to note that. Here, here's an example of what you might want to note. Um, perhaps you're working with a family whose, um, you know, significant other uh, is recently, um, you know, coming out of uh, jail and that impacts the client in one way or another. Perhaps, you know, there could be many reasons why that is. Um, but you, you know, you might want to say, you know, um, the individual informed me that this individual is coming, you know, coming out of jail, and then what impact that would have on the individual. Again, not necessarily important to know if everything is okay, but if there is a significant impact to the client because of that, or the client feels that there's a significant impact to them, you want to you want to make note of it. Um, and again, we just kind of spoke about relevant um, unbillable, unbillable events. Uh, so progress notes are expected to be written contemporaneous with service provision. Um, and so what I will say about that is you should write the progress note as soon as possible, as soon as you're able to write it after the event, the event has occurred, in part because that's how you get the most accurate reporting. Um, if you wait days or even weeks to, re um, to complete your progress notes, uh, who knows if the, the details are still as um, clear as they would have been um, had you completed it within, you know, a few hours at the same time or, you know, within the next day of the event. So um, I do want to encourage providers to, to make sure that they're writing their notes in a timely fashion. So what's required in a, in a, um, in a progress note? Here are some of the basic uh, information that's required. Again, this will um, differ if you have any electronic health record. So, for example, a lot of that standard demographic information will pull into the notes, not something that you would need to input every time you did a note. Um, if you're on paper or you don't have an electronic health record, perhaps you might have to input um, all of the demographic information every time you write a note. Um, um, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, most providers don't input that information. Um, all of, I think pretty, pretty much what we hear in the, uh, out in the field is that there's some type of electronic uh, process going on. Um, you also want to provide service provision details. So, what, how, you know, how did you meet with the field? What's the modality? Individual. Uh, I met with them individual face-to-face. -face. Met with them via the fo a phone call. I mean, you just want to um, explain kind of your mode of meeting them. Um, and then you want to talk about duration and location and credentials. This is really kind of all standard information. When you get down to the body, I want to say, of the progress note, kind of where you're detailing, kind of what happened, um, with the individual or the family for that day. You really want to um, make sure that um, you're talking about, you know, what was, you're, you're linking the progress note back to the goals and objectives. So what, what was it that you were focused on for that day? Um, you know, what, what was the intervention? What did you do? How did the family respond to it? Uh, were they receptive? Did, you know, did they get the concepts quickly? Were they challenged? Did they think they needed a different way of meeting that goal? So you want to kind of have all that noted in the progress note. Um, and again, you also want to know kind of what's the plan moving forward. So how are you, how are you and the family going to work together in the future? You know, do you have a, a session set up with them in the next week or so? Or, you know, is there some other um, 
intervention that you're going to be doing. And so you really just kind of want to note all of that in the progress note. Again, I want to emphasize quality um, over quantity. This can be done relatively, um, you know, within, within a few sentences or not. Um, and so you want to make sure that you include that. Uh, the other the other piece that we get questions around when it comes to progress notes is writing progress notes for groups. And so there is some guidance um, in the provider manuals that Ann mentioned earlier um, regarding this. But I just want to say just a few quick things, which is um, that you must write a progress note for group interactions um, that, again, must indicate that group is the modality and detail the number of participants, um, as well as uh, the providers who are present. Uh, group services are still subject to uh, having a, an objective and goal identified for that particular group. Um, and so what is it, what was it that you were working on in the group? Um, and so that it can tie back to each individual. Um, and, and for the most part, a group note, uh, progress note is usually written for the group session itself, so a collective note in terms of what happened with that, with that group. But then um, a progress note is also written for the individual um, who was a participant in that group. And so, um, and that would be because if something came up with a particular individual um, relative to their performance in the group, you know, perhaps they were challenged, perhaps something significant happened, that you would be able to detail that for that particular client. Would that be relative uh, or relevant for um, that to be in everyone else's record per se? but would be relative uh, for that particular client, you would want to detail that. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, it back over to Ann, so just walk us through the uh, putting it all together. Great. Um, the other thing I just thought of as Yvette was talking about groups is that it's not uncommon in family peer support for you to start working with a family individually and for you to, uh, you know, find out that maybe they would be interested in, benefit from some kind of group intervention. That's a great um, thing when it happens, but make sure you go back and update your treatment plan and the goals and objectives so it reflects that group work is going to be part of, um, of their plan. So um, putting it all together. So we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, Joey. Um, who is 10, and he was referred uh, to family peer support by a school social worker. Family peer support arranged for Joey to be seen by a licensed practitioner of the healing arts who prepared a recommendation. Um, they didn't fill in all of the information here, so uh, we would actually want to go back and have them complete that. But what we do know is that Joey, uh, his mother's name is Kathy, um, has been diagnosed with a depressive disorder. and. Um, we are also know this other information from the recommendation form, that Joey has some uh, concerns in the area of self-direction um, and social relationships. So he has difficulty managing strong feelings in response to bullying, leading to physical altercations in school. And he has difficulty sustaining age-appropriate peer relationships, and he's isolating himself in response to um, his depression. So uh, the, the licensed practitioner felt like uh, family and youth, uh, family peer support um, would be a helpful service. Um, and the needed intervention is that family peer support will assist the parent to, abstain, to obtain school support and other services needed by Joey and help the parent support Joey to connect with peers. The LPHA also recommended psychosocial rehab. You can see this in the recommendation because they were both recommended at the same time. It gives you a perfect opportunity to collaborate. Um, and to understand how each other are working with Joey. Um, and again, the mechanisms for that collaboration will look different depending on who's providing the services. Um, but, and then the, there's a sort of summary reason for the recommendation, and that is that Joey is withdrawing from his peers in school. He's been suspended twice due to physical altercations. The school is considering homebound instruction, and his mother does not agree with this approach. Joey needs support to get involved in peer activities based on his interests. So you can see you're going to have to tease out which piece is the PSR going to work on and which piece will family peer support work on. Um, obviously, you might get some recommendations that are really just for the service that you offer. Now, um, this particular provider happens to use the FANS, the Family Assessment of Needs and Strengths. They um, had a conversation with the parent using the FANS, and they identified these areas in which the parent um, needed uh, some support. They needed support in figuring out how to be more involved and be a, more of an advocate um, for Joey, in, in this case, particularly with school, but perhaps in other ways. 
um, they needed to know, they, they felt like they needed help knowing more about service options. Um, they were not satisfied with the school placement, so they were looking for some assistance in that regard, um, nor were they satisfied with Joey's um, participation in school. You're going to see a slide in the resource section of the slide deck that links you to um, more information on FANS. Um, these items will make more sense if you actually have been trained in FANS, but um, what, what this does is it adds, um, you know, some information from the parent's perspective to the information you got from the LPHA. So again, just to, I'm not going to go through this, but this looks at what we talked about before. You're going to be writing goals, objectives, and outlining your interventions. And here, uh, over the next three slides, we're going to give you a few examples of the kinds, how this might look. Um, I think Yvette really made a great point earlier in that you, uh, less is more sometimes. Uh, there is no reason to overwhelm families with, you know, seven or eight goals, two, three, three max. Um, you likely may have more than one objective for each goal, but just for simplicity's sake today, we kind of slimmed this down. But the objectives would be a couple of different steps that you would take um, to help you help Kathy accomplish that goal, which she's in, interested in because it's going to help Joey with his needs. So Kathy will become more familiar with available supports to assist Joey with school challenges. That's her global overall goal, very broad. Kathy will meet with Joey's teacher uh, and school social worker within the next two months to discuss Joey's needs and develop a plan to meet his needs. So that's a pretty specific objective. She's going to meet with them in the next two months. They're going to put together a plan. Lots of possible objectives you could have here. I know those of you who do this work are thinking, oh, there's so many different kinds of things that Kathy uh, might want to work on. And the third column, the interventions or services, uh, talks about what you, the family peer advocate, are going to do to support Kathy in this work. So the family peer advocate will meet with Kathy twice a week for one hour from October 1st to December 30th to assist Kathy to create a list of questions specific to Joey's school needs, support Kathy to arrange the meeting with Joey's teacher and school social worker, support Kathy during the meeting, um, and meet with Kathy following the meeting to debrief and determine next steps. Sorry about some of those typos there. Uh, the next goal, Kathy uh, will assist Joey in enhancing his social skills. So the objective there, one of the objectives that we have under that goal is that Kathy will identify and connect Joey with one new social opportunity within the next two months. And the family peer advocate is going to meet with Kathy once a week for an hour from October 1st through the end of the year to explore natural supports available to the family to identify recreational resources for Joey within the community, to assist Kathy to develop strategies, to assist Joey with his challenging behaviors, and to help Kathy collaborate with the psychosocial rehab provider as they each support Joey. Next goal, Kathy will ensure that Joey's behavioral health needs are met. Again, broad goal, more specific objectives, Kathy will identify and connect Joey to service providers to meet his behavioral health needs within the next two months. Joey came to family support without ongoing um, clinical services, um, so perhaps Kathy is interested in um, reaching out with the support of the family peer advocate to try to get Joey connected to a therapist of some type. So they're going to meet with Kathy once a week for an hour, um, identify behavioral health resources within Joey's community, support Kathy to arrange behavioral health appointments with Joey. Um, and link Kathy to transportation resources for Joey's uh, appointments to identify behavioral health providers. So you can see the family peer advocate is um, helping her, again, to identify uh, with that area that she's feeling uh, challenged with, which is um, being more active, finding out where those uh, services are in the community, and actually doing some problem solving around how, is she gonna, how are they going to get there so that that service can actually be delivered. You'll notice that in the intervention section, we're talking about a time frame. They're going to work on this in the next two months. Um, the family peer advocate, you know, it looks like they're going to be working with Kathy anywhere between one and two, maybe three hours in a busy week. Um, and um, they've got some very specific things that they're going to be working on. We also have in the objective, um, some, you'll notice that each of the objectives, it's pretty easy to know when that's been accomplished. So, um, you know, Joey will be receiving some sort of services to help with his behavioral health uh, sometime in the next couple of months. 
Um, some of those objectives might actually be even more specific than that. For example, Kathy might be reporting back on um, increased, um, you know, attendance at school or improved um, sibling interactions at home. So there's all different kinds of ways you can write those objectives. Um, and I know you all are looking for lots more examples and we'll continue to work with you on um, examples of some of these ways of documenting things um, as we move forward, but just a taste of that um, for today. And here's an example of um, a progress note that might be written somewhere along the way as um, the Family Peer Advocate is working with Kathy on behalf of Joey. The Family Peer Advocate met with Kathy to plan for next week's school meeting. Kathy expressed a concern that the school staff won't listen to her because they, quote, think she is demanding. The Family Peer Advocate reassured Kathy that her concerns were reasonable and reflected uh, her concern, Kathy's concern for Joey. The FPA and Kathy reviewed her list of questions, presumably that were written in the previous visit, and concerns, and role played how she could talk about these with school staff in a way that focused on their shared interest in Joey's success. So here we're working on some parent skill around how do you actually advocate effectively. Kathy reported that this was helpful, feedback from the parents, and she asked the family peer advocate to help her stay on track during the meeting. So we know now that Kathy's had input here. The Family Peer Advocate didn't just impose themselves on her in the meeting, Kathy's actually asked her to help out. The Family Peer Advocate also helped Kathy think of some ways to help Joey feel less anxious about attending the meeting. The Family Peer Advocate checked to be sure that Kathy had a ride to the next meeting, and Family Peer Advocate and Kathy will be brief immediately following the meeting. So now we have a plan for, we know when they're gonna be meeting again, the date might even be in there in the note, um, and we know what those next steps look like. So that's an example of a progress note. Obviously, this note doesn't include all that other information about location and time and um, that Yvette talked about, but that would be there um, in your electronic health record. Um, and some electronic health records will actually use kind of a drop-down menu that will have you tag this particular note um, and uh, visit with the family to one of the goals that you're working on, and you'll be able to go back to your treatment plan and do that. Uh, for those of you on the phone who are supervisors, um, we just, uh, you, we know you know this, but this, uh, it's not a train and turn loose sort of situation with documentation. Getting better at documentation takes time. It's an ongoing process. Um, you can really make uh, this work better if talking about and reviewing documentation is a part of your regular supervision with family peer advocates. And for those of you who are family peer advocates, if this isn't happening for you, um, try to put that on the list of things you want to talk with your supervisor about. Even if you think your documentation is great, uh, bring it in periodically and, and actually really sit down in a structured way and look and see if it meets all the criteria for being complete and appropriate. Um, does it reflect um, those principles that we talked about earlier? Um, and does it meet all the standards for compliance with documentation? And everyone, supervisors and family care advocates, if you have questions about what's required, we really encourage you to reach out and ask us, talk to the state agencies, um, and network with your colleagues to, um, to learn a little bit more. So I'm gonna review um, some of, or Yvette's gonna be taking a look at some of the questions you've submitted, and I'm going to review some of the resources that we have. Um, you'll, these slides will be posted, so these resources will be available to you. Here's a link to the part one webinar. Um, there are uh, online modules on documentation, these aren't specifically for family peer advocates, but they review uh, principles and best practices for documentation. This is on the CTAC website, might be something you'd be interested in taking a look at. Um, we had a lot of questions last time that related to billing, so I put some links in here to some of the billing uh, information that's available. Um, those of you who have taken the Parent Empowerment Program training for family peer advocates, um, there are uh, several modules in that training that you might wanna review that speak in one way or another to treatment planning, documentation, and outcome measurement. Uh, this is the link to the main page in the Department of Health that has all kinds of information that um, would be helpful. Here's a link to the FANS uh, information. Um, and also, we got a lot of questions last time. I, I sense that there are family peer advocates out there working all by themselves in agencies without other family peer advocates, and they're kind of wondering, how do I learn more about the work that I'm doing and how to do it really well? Um, and there are re great resources out there for you through Families Together in New York State. And um, I provided a link to their website here and also Nancy Craig's email address. And she can connect you 
um, to regional uh, parent advisors. There are two in each of the OMH regions, um, and their job is to help you uh, do this work really well. Uh, these are state mailboxes for your questions. Um, this is the OMH CFTSS list serve sign up instructions. New information about all these services, including requirements around documentation and other technical details, come out through this listserv. So please follow these steps and sign up for that listserv. Uh, these are a couple of other listservs and our basic contact information at CTAC. And with that, we have about 10 minutes left to take some of your questions, and I'm going to turn back to Yvette. Yeah, and so thank you for that. Um, we do have a, a few questions that have come in, and I'll just take the first one because it's around uh, writing progress notes for, for groups. And so the question is just the clarity around whether or not to, uh, a progress note is needed for the group session itself, and then a progress, is a progress note needed for the individuals. Uh, so in essence, making a particular individual have two notes, the group note and then the individual group note. And so I want to say yes, that's the clarity. So the, the one group note that you write could be the one note that is applicable to every member in the group. All right, and this is more about what, you know, what was the goal and objective of the group, overall how the group, you know, went. You know, you probably would talk about participants, but not necessarily specific partic participants. So that's probably a note that could, um, and again, it really differs in terms of your electronic health records. Some electronic health records, um, I know is able to file both an individual um, uh, group note for, for a participant as well as just an overall general um, group note, but both are required. So there's the general note for, you know, the session, and then there's um, how the individual progressed in the session. What did they learn? What were some of their challenges? And so, um, yeah, so it essentially would be two notes for every participant at that. So hopefully that provides some clarity around that. There's another question here around uh, a change in treatment plan and whether or not that would have an impact on billing, um, and, uh, you know, because it differed from the original. And so here's, here's what I want to say. It is important from a billing standpoint in that whatever you are working on a particular goal um, demonstrated through the progress note, if that goal is no longer active on a treatment plan, or uh, no longer there, then that would have an impact. Because remember, your goal was to be working with the individual on those needs and concerns that have been identified in the treatment plan. And so when they don't mesh, when you're working on perhaps an inactive goal, then those services are actually not authorized for that individual. And that's why it's important to understand the link between all of the documentation and how they all work together. Um, so if you find that you're working with someone in a goal that you wrote uh, no longer applies to them, either because they've met the goal or because it just it wasn't realistic for that particular individual or family or for a number of other reasons, then you should up the, um, update the treatment plan accordingly so that moving forward when you're working on the new goal that you would identify in the treatment plan, that, it be, that you would be able to build on that. But yeah, so essentially if the treatment plan is not updated and you, don't, you have not captured the work that you are um, doing and it hasn't been authorized with the individual, then um, essentially you should not get reimbursed for those, for those visits. And Yvette, that relates to another question that came in that someone asked about how long do you have to update the treatment plan to reflect, for example, that you're recommending the treatment plan now includes the parent participation in a group activity. Um, and I think the answer to that is you want to be sure that you update that treatment plan before you submit a bill um, that has them participating in a group. Um, there are some things that are a little bit more subtle. So you notice some of those goals are very broad. And there may be, you know, in the course of your day-to-day -day work, there are things that are going to come up that you're going to address that don't, that are, that are relatively small and fall under the umbrella of what you already have written, but something as significant as you've now made a recommendation that they attend a group, that would be something where you'd want to update the treatment plan um, and uh, before you submit that bill. Now, remember, um, you don't need to be, you know, sending these treatment plans um, uh, to uh, the managed care plans unless that's something that they're asking you to do. It's really something that you're doing 
um, internally. Of course, if, if it's been revised, you're going to want to run it by your supervisor and get the appropriate signatures from the parent and the supervisor. Um, but uh, if you've added a new service, that is something that you're going to want to update before you start providing it. Um, yeah, Andrew, we received some subsequent questions. I just want to reiterate a point that you said, which um, I think one of the questions is relative to, you know, um, when you update, you know, how, how long you have to get um, authorization. And again, I want to kind of mirror what you said, which is sometimes what you need to work on is um, perhaps you're going to modify an objective, but not an overall goal. So, um, you know, so perhaps you're still working, like if we went back to that example where uh, Kathy was going to be working with the FDA to really kind of uh, figure out how to address, uh, you know, um, the challenging behaviors of her son, uh, you know, with the school, um, perhaps, you know, one of your objectives to change in the manner in which you're going to address that goal, but the goal remains the same. And so I think there there is a difference from that. But uh, Again, treatment plan should be, uh, and all of this paperwork really should be a, li a living, breathing document. And I know sometimes, uh, you know, regulatory or our own kind of organizational processes get in the way of us doing this as, as consistent as we need to do it. Um, but that really, again, that really shouldn't stand in the way of making sure that you are, uh, you have the accurate plan for the family. Um, and so treatment plans can be updated at any time, and minimally, though, they must be updated um, within 180 days. But that doesn't mean you have to wait that long to update it. It means that a significant change came along. You can update it at any time, and then it gets, um, you know, you're working with the family on this. They agree it needs to be updated. You do that and then, um, and then move on to service provision. Thanks, Yvette. Um, someone asked how many services need to be provided to the family monthly, and there is no set requirement. Uh, some families may need, um, you know, kind of intensive help for just a month. Other families may need your support every couple weeks um, for a, a few months. Some families may need support for longer, uh, but there's no kind of minimum requirement. There are limits on how many hours of service you can provide in a single day. So you'll want to take a look at the uh, provider manual and billing manual to be sure that you're um, following those, uh, you know, keeping those limits in mind. And they are soft limits. So if there are situations where uh, something that exceeds those limits is, uh, you know, medically necessary and you can justify that, you need to have a conversation with the plan. Um, that, so there are some ways to modify those uh, daily uh, unit of service limits, but no minimum requirement. Um, the other thing I want to talk about here, and, you know, Yvette and I had this conversation yesterday, um, and it's a tricky one. That you're all looking at that example and saying, all right, how many hours does this equal? So I'm going to work with on this goal for an hour once a week. I'm going to work on that goal more frequently, probably twice a week, because that's more involved and it's urgent and we need to move forward with it. I'm going to work on that a couple times a week. Um, and then this third goal that we're going to work on, you know, roughly once a week. These are kind of um, estimates. So what you're saying, what, what, what someone reviewing your treatment plan is going to see there is I'm going to be working with this family probably twice a week on these three things. No one's going to get down to like, I spent 20 minutes on this and I spent 40 minutes on that. I mean, your notes will reflect that, but um, the, the, the treatment plan can be a little bit more general than that. You're giving people an idea. I'm going to meet with this family once or twice a week for somewhere between probably two and three hours. Um, all together. Um, if there's a week where you're not meeting because the family's on vacation, you don't have to go back and amend the treatment plan. But if there's a crisis and all of a sudden, you know, you're going to need to be working with the family a lot more than that, that is the kind of thing that would require a change. I hope that's helpful to folks. Yeah. And also just to say that this is not like, it's not as clean cut as probably the example demonstrates. There's sometimes where you'll be working on a goal with a family and you're covering um, multiple goals, right, or multiple objectives. Like you're doing it all in tandem because it all relates. And so, again, as Ann said, it's not like, you know, you have to say I'm going to work 10 minutes on this one, 20 minutes on that one, just overall. Um, again, you have, you know, soft limits to stay, to be mindful of. But, um, yeah, so just to point that out. So there's a question about how does note writing differ for family peer support and caregiver family support? 
So uh, just a little background for everyone. Family Peer Support Services are a CFTSS, a Child and Family Treatment and Support Service. Caregiver Family Support is a service that's available to children who meet the eligibility criteria to receive HCDS, or Home and Community-Based Services. Um, it's a service that some of you may recognize uh, from waiver days. So um, the fundamentals of progress note writing are exactly the same for those two services. Um, the, the, again, you need to be sure that the work that you're doing and that's reflected in the progress note is consistent with the service definition. And there are manuals specific to HCBS services that will give you more information on family caregiver support. Um, the family caregiver service doesn't necessarily need to be delivered by a, a peer, although it could be. Um, and there is a little bit more uh, flexibility within that service in terms of working sometimes with the child as well as with the family, as I understand it. But um, my sense of the biggest difference is that if you are providing a peer service, a family peer support service, um, over the course of all of your notes, not necessarily in any one note, you're going to want to, um, you know, kind of uh, bring to life the fact that your lived experience um, and your um, particular engagement and outreach skills related to that lived experience are at work. Um, obviously, that may also be the case if you happen to be a person with lived experience who's delivering family caregiver support. But um, in terms of fundamentals, uh, unless the vet thinks it's something I, I'm not thinking of here, I think it's pretty much the same. No, I, I think you covered it, Anne. I really okay. don't have anything other than it to add, yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we've reached the time here, um, and we're, uh, when this webinar closes down, you're going to receive um, a survey that pops up. I would, last time you all provided us with some really great information about things that you need clarification on and resources, additional training that you'd like on this and or other topics in the future. And I really want to reassure you that we are taking a close look at that. I'm actually working on um, a tool right now that's, uh, that comes from a recommendation somebody made on the last webinar. So please take a couple of minutes to um, provide that feedback. Um, and as always, we're available by email if you have additional questions. Um, and if we didn't get to your particular question today and you want to reach out, feel free to do that as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. And um, we uh, encourage you to come on the 31st and listen to our state partners talk about the guidance documentation. Thank you.